So I'm Giovanni Singleton, Lunch Poems Coordinator. And thank you all for being here today. And this, it's kind of overcast, but there's lots of sun beaming here in this room. Um, and we'd like to thank the Morrison Library for hosting this event. Um, first, I invite you to sign up on our email list, which is over on the librarian's desk, and also on our website, lunchpoems.berkeley.edu. You can view this reading, as well as all of our past readings, um, as webcasts, and also on our YouTube channel. Okay, um, so this is our final event of the of the 2017-18 season. So please mark your calendars. We will be returning in September for our, uh, our really amazing kickoff event. And now please welcome Lunch Poems Director Jeffrey G. O'Brien, who will introduce this afternoon's readers. Thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, and I want to just ask you to keep applauding for Giovanni, who is the heart and soul of the programming all year round. <laughs> so yes, this is a joyous close to a great year of programming. We have 11 poets today, um, and they will be reading under the tyrannous logic of the alphabet. I'll be springing up in between each poet to read a, a tiny bio. Um, and I want to stress that these bios were self-written by the poets. Um, the first reader today is Daniel Benjamin, who is a PhD candidate in English and critical theory at UC Berkeley. His dissertation explores how poets like Dorothy Wordsworth, Amiri Baraka, Jack Spicer, and Amnor Basie Philip make space for multiplicity in their writing. He recently co-edited The Bigness of Things, New Narrative and Visual Culture. Daniel Benjamin. Thank you. Um, thank you, Jeffrey and Giovanni. Um, and thank all of you for being here. Um, I'm just going to read a couple of sections of this poem because it's very long. Um, OK. My soul doth magnify the Lord. Our conversation gave me irrepressible ideas that I followed as best I could. They don't spill over, contain to direction, like a small conversation that builds itself on shaky ground. Well, it is enough to go on, more or less. I am more or less extending my length, your distance, O oh Lord, in some morning rain I recorded well. Please tell me what I already know. Be the body that moves along beside me. The air is cool and odorless. The rain continues, the stretch my body made to another land of warmth and smog, and you reach out to me through this machine of strain and stretch. Rain is a small smell, shielding my movements and encircling my steps to this my spot that is fixed to me and moves me forward. I repel the pressure above my forehead, slouch hand and practice avoidance, keep close track of time's progress and advances, hold tight the small remaining dust that surrounds me. I submit to it, soft medium between us, and the long one I track with my stiff eyes blinking heavy to refresh their screens. We were in there side by side, giving up control to the circle that repeats warm bodies into a heat source. I move in the rhythm of your spirit, sleep in the wake of your desire, wake up to pick away. The hour still belongs to us, a rippling dream fantasy of political power, good morning. Together we can now supply confidence, feelings close to the body. The dimpled sky opens to a blue expanding wound, room to get lost in. It won't protect my face. You stay warming up my body in the same sky. I am, O Shahina, too happy in the sun, answering to the Blue Jays, very loud nesting, aggressive with his enemies, and I might be. I'll stop there, thank you. Our next poet is Selden Cummings, who's a junior studying English at UC Berkeley. He is a surfer, basketball player, and musician who performs rap music under the pseudonym Tommy Luck. Selden Cummings. Hello, everybody. Um, so normally, poets, I guess, modern poets, we write poems that don't rhyme. But since this is a reading, I really felt that rhyming was necessary. So this poem rhymes, sorry. <laughs> I hope you will join me 
in an exercise. Please close your eyes. Now imagine white lines of sand beneath bright blue skies, stretching away from miles beyond all size, beyond all time, like a circle with infinite sides, but simple as a rhyme, consistent as the tides which ebb and flow like the growth of your mind, divine as your eyes, which almost seem defined by design. I'm merely painting with signs, symbols and words to make this thing shine. Warm as the desert sometimes, but not nearly as dry. As clear as the sky I'm trying to describe, it's like a lake that's been multiplied by five billion times. It's the opposite of a desert, and unlike Vegas, there's no need for a pair of dice. This is the one and only saltwater paradise, so prepare yourself. We're going inside Poseidon's mind. That's right, the ocean. Or when in Rome, King Neptune's one and only abode, abode those open and wind-blown coves. That's right, <clears throat> the ocean. Sunken beneath whole folds, whole holes full of ancient gold and the water's cold over most of it, but who knows? Does pleasure grow when coals begin to glow? Is artistic fire a requirement for passionate ashes and smoke? Does warmth equal the satisfaction of interactive hope? In other words, is there a direct relationship between temperature and being in the zone? Maybe so, but for the animals down there, this ain't no joke, it's their home. And whether it's boiling hot or freezing cold, we can never pretend to know what they know. That's right the ocean. So, let us invoke a prayer for this salty, liquid snow. Oh, gods of the sea, please forgive us our plastic that wraps you in misery as I rap about this, the ultimate mystery. And though our respect may be broken, the ocean's arms remain wide open. Thus we pray, each of us a preacher speaking to teach by reaching each of your creatures, from the African glass catfish to the Alaska blackfish, the anemone fish to the angelfish to the angler catfish and the anglerfish, from the barracuda of the Caribbean to the only saltwater amphibian, a crab eating frog, not a cod or a cephalopod or a dogfish or a hogfish, but a frog, not even the antenna-ready frogfish, but it's a long list full of mollusks and over 300 species of octopus, I mean octopus, whoops, plus the nautilus and the giant squid, plus the scallop and the chitin and the cuttlefish. But don't forget the osteokites like the alligator gar or the arctic char or the chondrichthites, like every single sneaky type of subtle shark and the pinnipeds and the mammals, jellyfish, seabirds, every ocean animal lives in a world we can never hope to know, although we crawled from it so many years ago. So maybe, just maybe, it is our one true home. Thank you. I think if you rhyme off a cell phone, it's okay, even now. Our next reader is Nina Jukic, who's a fourth year undergraduate, intrigued by the mysteries of life, health and human suffering, literature and love, puns and Bay Area weather. This year she won the Dorothy Rosenberg Memorial Prize in Lyric Poetry and the Joan Lee Yang Memorial Poetry Prize and was a finalist for the Elizabeth Mills Crothers Prize in Literary Composition. You're greedy. She has been attending Lunch Poems since her first few months at Berkeley and is delighted to be here. Nina Jukic. Thank you for your ironic reading of that. It was meant to be ironic. <laughs> um, so one of the first poems that I ever really fell in love with was Proof Rock by T.S. Eliot, which I know is not original, but is true. Um, and so this is kind of alluding to that. And also rhyming, but pretending not to be rhyming, which I hear is another modern take on rhyme. <laughs> love song. <clears throat> I dreamt that I was walking. The dusty smell of desert struck me. Then I heard the sound of trumpets from another ridge, the looping pure note tuning that once sent beast to battle. That same singing sound which toppled oligarchies now accompanies the jazzy musings of young women in apartment buildings rearranging flowers in their sweatpants. I have driven to Big Sur. I have watched the light change, refract wind and sand off windows. I have polished doorknobs just to see a brighter gold and watched green apples gleam in the heat of a February noon. I have turned in indecision. I have woken to the linger of a tune. 
Hot and dozing though I was, I still was walking, still could dream, and dreamt of thick and feather boas draped on shoulders in cigar smoke gloom, an idle barefoot padding on the hardwood, or the whiz of records whirring, while the sunbeams made the carpet bloom beneath the music from another room. It returned me, and I turned back from the wall, slammed the door, said it wasn't what I meant at all, said I treasure my disasters with my triumphs, my trumpet heralds all. Her timber peels through windowed streets, lingers universally. She sings a symphony of places scrawled on candied sheets. She sings of blue walls singing for the sea. I recall a little recklessly beneath those pink and yellow striped marquees. Though I do not think that she has noticed me. I was walking, wandering the works and days of fingers, feet. I was about to eat, to roll away the years, the stone, to clean, to turn, to cross the bridge when the sound of trumpets woke me from a distant ridge which stands for nothing except what it is. Thanks. Our next poet is Yasmin Golan, who has never studied poetry formally, but picked up the Joan Lee Yang, Ina Kulbrith, Emily Chamberlain Cook, and Academy of American Poets prizes in poetry while studying history and folklore. She has adapted some of her poetry about invisible labor into many comics to reach new audiences and thinks Safeway cake decorating is the future of poetry. <laughs> I'm going to read two poems, and the first poem uses the word Abramovichian, by which I mean Marina Abramovich, and the artist is present. And it's entitled The Custodian, and I am the daughter of custodians. The Custodian. She will compact each loose bag of paper, lifting their plastic collars, turning and tying them diagonally, corner over corner, like a half-made braid or bread. Her imperfectly fitting shoes touch their soles to the soles of the tile setters who grouted this room. They've never met the builder and the cleaner working at opposite ends of creation and maintenance. Like a lab technician wet mounting the day's slides in order to observe the movement of bacteria in a patient's feces, she sees what's going on inside the university and its people. Each porcelain surface bathed in fragrant waters and patted down to remove its outbursts and excesses. The parts of itself it cannot see. It's unconscious. With, Abra <clears throat> with Abramovichian lucidity, she sees all. Their upbringing cast upside down on the room like a camera obscura. She stops to top off an invisible pint of pride because it's Friday at five and her paycheck climbs up her rent like an ant. This poem is about other forms of knowledge, hoax and hex. Who raised you? Who taught you the name of this leaf, the pot herb, the heels all, the ornament? how you cut a branch just above the bud, how to splice it and bind the wounds till they fruit, how to darn a heel with an egg, when to let the dough rest, when to let it rise, how to weight a kite, make the pot salty like the sea, put newsprint in your shoes before a winter's walk, use torn stockings to tie up garden hose, that's you there, second steeping tea, cutting coupons with your grandma's scissors. To braise, turn brown, then turn, then turn, then turn it down. Praise the apricots, save the kernels. To cut the branch, you must slit its throat, to root the succulent, 
separate the mother from her millions, who taught you how to string a chicken's legs to the Pope's nose, how to drown fruit flies in vinegar, snails in beer, how to build a fire, how to put it out. Thank you. Next is Beth Hightower, who is a queer half Chinese poet at UC Berkeley, double majoring in English and psychology. She'll be starting her PhD in English at Rutgers University in the fall, focusing on 19th century British literature. Beth Hightower. Uh, is this a good distance? Does namelessness bespeak that it is unnameable? What do I think of this world? It's not what I say. The light and airy day to day of sun, sea breeze, the ocean's orgastic teas. The only thing is in reverberation, reverie's verity, an aberration. And I am filled with a nameless hate, which may or may not be what says. You love hating this big dumb world, except when you are hating it, or hating to hate it, or hating to hate and then it doesn't look like anything to you. Not like searing seas, scorched earth, the seams of surf and turf sundered, sinkholes, splintering skyscrapers. Not like the world is no one's oyster and your pearl has a price. Thank you. Next up is Evan Clavon, who's a PhD candidate in English, working on a neurocognitive theory of what poetry makes happen. Please tell us your findings when you're done. <laughs> thanks, Jeffrey, and thanks to Giovanni, too. Um, so workshops sometimes have a rule that you're not supposed to write grandparent poems. Um, but this co-won one of the prizes, so I guess they can be okay. Uh, this deals with uh, my grandfather's decline through Parkinson's and dementia, but it's really more focused on my mother's caregiving for my grandfather and also uh, for myself and my brother while we were you know, becoming old enough to sort of recognize what was going on. Um, it's written in the third person so that when he shows up, it can be my grandfather or my younger self or both. Um, it also engages with the Kabbalist idea of Tsimsum, which is this idea of God having to withdraw himself from the universe in order to make space for creation, um, and also some other Jewish stories of sacrifice and children. He, she, he, Tsimsum, Fresno, 1991 to 1995. Where in the waters of the present he could not remember, on the bus bench wandered, she spotted driving by, him in the back seat confused, yet accepted, unquestioned the flaw to be hidden, command yet to be obeyed. Where repeating himself in place of his wife, just short of exasperation's plea, her commanding David to his overhearing estranged, as his repeating himself, petulant to defer to his child returned. Where swat off and stoop step lead to fall bruise and tremors under hold, hand to his forehead against the losing frustration, his descendants numbering three, yet she the handmaid returning pillar the ram. Where hand to her forehead and fatigue to be born, each week compartmentalizing the daily pills, each night wrestling his stocking the hall, her shuttling between child house and children, eyes wary for their exile from her own thoughts of leaving. Where bound to alter under the numbering indignities, he shrinks beside her labors to necessary distance out of birthright or sacrifice. In him she sees her future, as he grows to withdraw from his own adding to her nation of care. Where unhomed as a guest come to, seeing and knowing him or seeing him unknow, though little less in stories or bliss to be lost any more than blessings before, now the tremors unworrying him, mouth mute 
but to breathe and feed. And at last, freed from the law, to ashes cast in the grove, where for her mother he cried himself. In the end, he will overhear on the phone her saying, only once your parents have gone, do you feel fully your own, after driving him down the mountain, returning home. Thank you. Next is Haley Minish, who is a junior transfer student from Santa Monica Community College. This is her second semester at Cal. Her major is English and Linguistics, intended, and her interests are volunteering for lunch poems and taking naps on Memorial Day. Haley. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm really excited to be reading in Morrison Library because it's my favorite library. Um, and I'm also really nervous, if you can't tell. <laughs> um, the poem I'm reading today is a poem that I wrote um, for an assignment in Professor O'Brien's class last semester, um, which was also uh, my first semester here. Um, and this poem is really special to me because it was my first graded assignment that I got back. Um, and I was really happy with it and the grade. <laughs> Um, for this assignment, we were uh, required to write an imitation poem on a poem we read in class, and I chose to do mine on Gertrude Stein's Susie Asado. Um, and I loved her poem so much that I did both of my assignments on it. Um, and my, uh, my, po my imitation poem is called Belle Bastia, and I hope, I hope you all enjoy it. Growl, 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 growl licks. Belle Bastia. Growl, 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 growl licks. Belbastia. Belbastia is a name which is a one jewer, a symbol for a word that means no, no lidge. And when the candlelight dims, Eros is freed. This is a night. This is a night said to be in, um, in a me. These are the sexton that say the weapon to leave is a spear to Mars. Mars becomes wars. A heel, a heel is the start of a new life. Ascent, the old chorus, the old chorus is soiled, soiled which damaged and defiled, and well worn, well worn must. Who are, who are these promise cue us people? See it shine, and a snake that tells truth. It shows a red light. What is a red light? A red light is a refusal. Growl, 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 licks. Thank you. Our next poet is Taylor Lynn Osman, who's a senior study in cognitive science and English, so she can help you, Evan, um, with a minor in creative writing. She's interested in reading, poetry, nature, neuroscience, developmental psychology, and astronomy. She is finishing at Berkeley in the summer and studying in the Netherlands in the fall. Taylor. Thank you so much, Giovanni and Professor O'Brien. I know that I think at least three of us reading were in Professor O'Brien's workshop um, last semester, and we really loved that, so thank you. Um, this poem is called Monday, and I was thinking about um, the week, so I tried to make um, almost every line seven syllables. Monday, you had maybe walked alone to the place on the corner smiling once inside and feet on the hard floors you asked for coffee with 2% milk and a mug you brought from home. Why the stickers, you asked and learned that they were for people who took their coffees to go. Dropping a nickel in the tip jar because it's all you had, you turned toward the door and heard the sound of the nickel spinning on tin as you felt the warmth of the sun and just insisted. Sunlight was not ever really yellow today, but peach apricot plucked from two trees at once, if that's where they came from. A dog hurried past you. The bark that you saw on the tree was mold. The tree, a green tunnel laid from the inside. Leaves started to break. Outward and outwardly you pulled on your jacket and placed the receipt in your pocket. Slower footsteps on the floor and you waited for someone to leave or to get there. Thank you. Thank you. 
Shanushka Sawant is a second year bioengineering major and recipient of the 2017 and 2018 Eisner Prizes in Poetry. Her greatest loves are lyric verse and the works of Tolkien, which have served as a source of inspiration to her writing for the past 10 years. Shanushka. Um, this poem is in rhyme as well, and uh, like the earlier one, it's also about the sea, so here we go. The Siren and the Sea. A bulwark lingered beside the sea with her hair and her garments of heather, her bracelets of dew and cornflower glass, and her collars of cormorant's feathers. Betimes her bluffs grew heavy and chill, or green with the fern and the willows. Betimes they were sharp as a witch's flame and fragrant and fair as the billows. In Ammon the spires are washed with gold and glowing with moonstone and silver, where lavender's love lace and indigo made free by the banks of the river. Such is the best for a maiden's hall, for the maidens who danced by the quay. But summer is fresh and flowing and fine, and her torrents are heaven to me. Together we chanted the hymn of the tides and their presence as dear as a spell. How long have we dreamed of the icy stars in the shades of the cove where they dwell? For the huntress gleams on the frosty waves and renouncing her throne in the ether to lie by the pools where the flatfish sleep with the cloak of the waters beneath her. By sunrise our ballads grow pale to the dawn having yielded their might to the shore and the corals bloom with the waxing day like a bundle of pearls by the door. But my dinghy waits by the weathered pier, as you call from your pallet of shells, and the currents are steady and swift to the eye, whilst we sing to the surf in farewell. At eve we'll return to the silent cliff, where the sirens were forged by the thunder, and up from the blue come the hearts of the deep to carry you down to your slumber. Bid me good night and sweet rest, my love, sweet rest by the gates of your shrine where treasures come forth to my inky hands as we pass like the shoals through the brine. Thank you. Next poet is Claire Marie Stanchak, who's the author of two poetry books, Mouths from Noemi Press in 2017, and more recently, even Oil Spell, which just came out this spring from Omni Dawn Publishing. She is the co-editor and co-founded um, co-founder of Nyon Editions, which is a small press devoted to publishing chapbooks. She is filing her PhD dissertation in English this semester. Congratulations, Claire. The poem I'm going to read is taken from a series that I'm working on titled Religio Medici after the essay of that title by Thomas Brown. And this is called Dorothy. Unwebbed from the event of an angel carrying a basket, three apples, three roses, a corpse finger wrapped in mucus, blue as the day and cold. Say no and I say no again. Remember all the no you give. Pull out static, cracking points of light. Even so is death. Oncoming, little is known, almost nothing is known. Open dumpster, flowering boxes, the proud possessor of a collection of books, whose works include a life of Bridget, rain down, gaping gray, between two sides of a table, a world, your particular way of turning gloom in sun, passion out from which St. Dennis preaches with his head severed, tucked under his arm. Voice emerges from voice as color from color, sparks shape, disappearing droplets carry forth the sizing moon. One must refuse certain hauntings, witness a dragon swimming under the palm. Thank you. And our final reader is Anthony Tucci Barube, 
who is the events manager for the Berkeley Poetry Review and will be graduating this month with a degree in English and creative writing. While he is saddened by the prospect of leaving Berkeley, he will always cherish the heightened appreciation of the Wordsworthian line break and other valuable skills that his education has afforded him. And he's looking forward to the novel experience of bringing his own hide to market. Anthony. Thank you. Um, this poem, likewise, had its beginning in one of my workshops, so thank you to everyone in the room who had a hand in that, especially Professor O'Brien and Professor Singleton. Arrangement bouquet. There is something I want to say, but someone has already said it. Not in between, but between us there, where the clouds and the bed we left unmade and circulating like could have over walls and lawn what we left said aloud in between us and above the law of flattening things into words I could have said or had unsaid. Because there were no laws to flout there. Because to have is to have said and the one thing no one has said is the only thing I have. Someone flattening into a bed of flowers like into something I said or some things left unsaid. Cloudlets that flow into a law of pressing flowers to bed with words that crowd into words. The unsaid flattening into the lawn of the said. Or I want to say that the only broken thing is the thing left said or said to be law. Either to say is to want to have artificialized the unfinished forms or is to unyoke the conjugal before overthrowing the articles indefinitely. For I want to have what I could have said and say it to. So when I left in bed, said flowers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, as Giovanni mentioned, um, please reserve all the first Thursdays of all of the months of next year for the great program that we'll have starting with the kickoff in September. Um, we have an exciting list of prospective invitees. The only one I know for sure is Ben Lerner, who will be coming in his guise as poet, not as novelist. Um, so thank you once again to all the poets for reading and for you for coming. Let's re-applaud and go back out.